All right, let's open our Bibles in the Old Testament to Exodus chapter 10 tonight. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 10, and time permitting, we may get through chapter 11 because it's very short. I make no promises about that. Uh, chapter 10, we have two plagues that we need to look at before we get to what we've referred to as the capstone plague. The uh, tenth plague is the final judgment of God against Egypt and her gods and her ruler who was himself, or claimed at least, of course, to be divine. So what we've seen in the plagues thus far is the way in which God uses what's, what appear to be three cycles of three plagues, right? And so there are certain features of the plagues, the first, the fourth, and the seventh have features in common, the second, the fifth, the eighth have certain features in common, and then the third, the sixth, and the ninth. And so there seem to be three cycles of three plagues, and then the tenth plague, which brings the final act of divine judgment against the nation. And the Lord, through all of this, has been working to accomplish His ultimate sovereign purpose uh, in the midst of this, uh, this effort to deliver Israel from the land of Egypt. And what we want to see is that God is very intentional in what He does and why He does it. We said last week, the Lord did not need ten plagues to get the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. And he says that explicitly in chapter 9. He says, if I'd stretched out my hand, this would have been over when it started, right? He didn't need ten plagues to get Israel out of Egypt, just like he didn't need six days to make the world, right? God does the things that he does in the way that he does for his own reasons. So what are some of the reasons here? Well, God wants to be glorified. God is seeking in all things, in the works of creation and providence, to glorify himself. But he's also seeking to bring judgment on a pagan nation that has oppressed the children of Abraham. He's also seeking to judge the arrogance of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. He's also seeking to bring judgment against the gods of Egypt, as we've seen. He's also seeking to teach the Egyptians about himself. And not only the Egyptians, but teach the Israelites about himself. Because even though they are descended from Abraham... They have no codified law at this point. They have no scripture. And so they really know very little about the true God other than the oral tradition that's been passed down to them, which would, would surely be uh, somewhat incomplete when we compare it to the fullness of God's revelation. Not only that, but we've seen in the last couple of weeks that God is even working through this act of judgment and self-revelation to prepare a people for himself. Not just the Israelites, but some from among the Egyptians who will join with Israel in the Exodus. And they will become part of the company of Israel. And then even people in the land of Canaan. We've made reference a couple of times in the last two weeks to the experience of Rahab, the city of Jericho in Joshua chapter 2, where 40 years later, the, the city of Jericho is shut up in fear of the Israelites because they've heard the stories of the plagues. And so God is bringing together so many different purposes. And I want you to think about this. I have a friend that I'm studying with and talking to a good bit right now who's going through a crisis in his faith. And one of the things that we've been talking about some is, is it possible that God might ordain things to be in the way that they are for reasons that exceed our full comprehension. You know, in the moment, it seems like God's not working this out in the way that seems best to me. And yet, is it possible that God, from a divine vantage point, sees more pieces in this puzzle than you and I are able to see? And, I, and of course, I'm asking that rhetorically. I think undeniably that is indeed the case. And I hope that this text that we've been looking at of the Exodus is helping you to see that or to be renewed in your faith about that. So we're going to pick up in chapter 10. We're going to read through the first uh, half or so of it and then pray and ask God's blessing uh, as we always do. Let's go down through verse 11 to start. Then the Lord, Yahweh, said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. And they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. 
And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go that they may serve Yahweh their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve Yahweh your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to Yahweh. But he, Pharaoh, said to them, Yahweh be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve Yahweh, for that is what you were asking. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. All right, let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity midweek to come together once again to open your word together. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we open the scriptures, that your spirit might help us to open further our eyes and our hearts, that we would see the power, the authority, the, uh, the truth and the true sovereignty that you have uh, in all the earth, that we would imp- be impressed by your judgments, God, that we would be impressed by your patience and your grace, and that we might be moved to greater reverence and greater gratitude to you for all your kindness to us. Father, this is a a holiday for our nation that makes us mindful of so many who have served uh, on behalf of our nation and have served to protect our freedoms and to expand freedom across the globe. And we're thankful, Father, for those who have served in this way. We pray, God, that you would bless them. And we think tonight, Father, of many families for whom this is a difficult uh, season. Uh, as they as they remember loved ones who served and yet who are no longer with us. And we pray, Father, uh, that such opportunities as this in our nation's history might be good for us, that you would use it to make us mindful of the things that are important, that we might set aside the sin and the stupidity that seems to characterize us right now, and that instead we would look to you as the source of our blessings, as the source of our freedoms, and as the source of all that is right and good. And that we might fear you and honor you as God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So one of the things that is fascinating to me in this latter part of the plagues is the way in which Pharaoh, his interaction with Moses develops. You notice how much more text is being given to these latter plagues. I mean, if you just compare in your Bibles, the seventh plague is a longer plague in just in terms of text than the earlier plagues. This eighth plague is very long. Now, the ninth plague, it kind of goes back to a short plague, but then the tenth plague is going to stretch over two or three chapters. And so uh, what, what you're seeing, the reason for that is that there is more interaction. There's more conversation. The Lord is drawing out this opportunity for Pharaoh to be confronted with his word, to be challenged with the authority of this God that some months earlier he would not even acknowledge. Now the last plague, the plague of hail, the seventh plague, would have occurred at the end of January or early February based on the agricultural references that are there. You remember that some of the grain was destroyed, but some of the grain, the wheat and the spelt or emmer, had not come up yet. And so it was spared. And so now we're looking probably a couple of months later. We said that the entire period of the plagues is at least eight months, probably close to a year. Uh, And we can figure that out in a couple of different ways. The, The tenth plague will help us date the end point of it. And so uh, this is probably a a couple of months later, and these additional crops have had time to come up. And there there appears to be some hope for Egypt agriculturally. We're not going to starve to death, right? And that is when God once again uh, inserts himself and asserts his authority uh, in Pharaoh's administration. And so in verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart. 
And we made mention of this at the end of last week's class, that at the end of chapter 9, you have Pharaoh hardening his heart. You have a general statement, passive statement, Pharaoh's heart was hardened without identifying the agent. And then here at the beginning of chapter 10, Yahweh takes responsibility. He claims the right. And again, if you uh, are troubled by that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the last few uh, classes where we've dealt with that topic. Look at the study notes. But fundamentally, the, the, uh, the reality of God's authority in this world is that he has the right to treat evil men in the way that seems best to him. God is not working with a neutral set. He is not making Pharaoh evil. What he is doing is he is judging an evil person. And he is bearing long with an evil person. God would be justified in striking Pharaoh to the ground immediately. Right? The wages of sin is death. And God would be justified in doing that not only in Pharaoh's life, but in every one of our lives. But Romans 9 asks the question, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering vessels prepared for destruction? That's Pharaoh, folks. That's Judas Iscariot. That's Adolf Hitler. That's a whole lot of people who are unregenerate and will remain unregenerate even into eternity and will suffer the penalty of the wrath of God forever. And you say, why does God let them live so long? Why does God not just take them out right at the beginning? Because God is desiring to show us something of his justice and his glory by allowing the wicked to endure. And that's what God says about his interaction with Pharaoh in chapter 9. And so that's what's still happening here in chapter 10. The Lord said, go into Pharaoh, for I've hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them. Here's a purpose statement. You see that? God says, this is what I've done, and this is why I've done it. What I've done, I've hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why have I done it? That I might show my signs among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, so that you may know, so that you, Moses, you, Israel, may know that I am Yahweh. Um, something that we saw repeatedly when we were studying the book of Genesis together is the idea of God's judgment mingled with grace, right? Judgment mixed with mercy. And the idea is that even when God brings judgment against sin, there is a larger redemptive purpose in it. And we would think, how in the world could that be? You know, maybe we're tempted to think of that in kind of a dualistic manner, either law or gospel, you know, either condemnation or justification and forgiveness. But actually, God is going to bring about some of these uh, acts of judgment and grace through the same events. And so for Egypt... And for Pharaoh, these events are acts of judgment. For Israel, for Moses, they are opportunities. They are acts of grace. Do you see how that is? And God, by doing one thing, is able to accomplish many things, right? He does one thing historically, but redemptively, he is purposing to accomplish many things. And this is why Paul can say with such confidence in Romans chapter 8, we know that for those who love God, God works all things together for good, right? He works all things together for the ultimate good, the saving good, the saving purpose of conforming his people to Christ. That's what he's talking about in context, right? So he's not saying that everything in our lives works for our material good, but it works for the ultimate good of the blessing of his people. Do you see that here? Why is God hardening Pharaoh's heart? Well, because Pharaoh's just an evil guy and God's judging him. Yes, but not only that. He's also doing it to bless Israel. You and I are supposed to benefit from the reality that God judges the wicked. Do you realize that? You and I, this is, this is one of the attributes of God that would be unmanifest if God were a universalist. You know what universalism is, right? Universalism is the idea that everyone will in the end be saved. Now, that's a heretical idea. I don't think that that is within the boundaries of orthodoxy, okay? Okay. But uh, there have been people through history, and certainly in modern times, many people who are universalists. And they would say, in the end, God is love, and therefore everyone, perhaps even the devil, will be saved. Well, if that's the case, you will not see a full manifestation of the perfect justice of a holy God. Right? There will be no justice in the end then. 
Uh, that would be an unmanifested attribute. But in fact, it is a manifested attribute because there will be people in hell in eternity, right? Not everyone's going to be saved. In fact, Jesus says many will follow the broad path that leads to destruction and few the path that leads to life. And so here, God's people are going to benefit from the fact that God judges sin and sinners. How are they going to benefit? Well, they're going to benefit by telling their children and their grandchildren. You see that? This is going to be so important in the law of Moses. This idea of generational uh, instruction, discipling the next generation. And let me say this real quickly, okay? Because I, and I don't want you to misunderstand this point, because you know how strongly I feel about the church's teaching ministry, right? I mean, I, that's the, that's why we have a church, okay? But but whose responsibility fundamentally is it to disciple the next generation? It's not the pastors. It's not the churches. Certainly not the public schools. It's not the Christian schools. It's not the Sunday schools. It's the parents and the grandparents, right? Now, should the church come alongside and help with that? I think that we can and we should, right? Absolutely. My life was blessed and enriched by Sunday school teachers and other people in the church who came alongside my parents and helped disciple me in the way of the Lord, and I'm thankful for that. But fundamentally, this is a parental responsibility, and you can't just farm that out. And unfortunately, what has happened throughout history, right? Now, Sunday school is a modern phenomenon. Churches did not have Sunday school for 1900 years okay but uh but but what's happened unfortunately through many generations even in the old testament we see this the parents of the covenant community kind of farm out the discipling of their children and what happens is a generation arises that doesn't know the lord and and then i sit with parents and they say well we took our children to to church every sunday i don't know why they don't believe well it's because the only time they ever saw or heard about the Lord was in church on that Sunday. And a lot of times the stories that I hear are, are parents who don't go to church and are not involved in any way in their faith dropping their kids off, right? I'll drop my kid off at Sunday school and maybe they will be a better Christian than I am. Well, I'm sorry, but don't be surprised when that doesn't work out. Now, sometimes, blessedly, praise God, it does work out, right? But uh, that's the exception, not the rule. The plan is... That Moses and the children of Israel are going to talk about these events with their children and their grandchildren. And they are going to know that there is a God in heaven who has not only redeemed his people, but has judged sinners. I want my children to know both. That God is a good and loving God who justifies the ungodly and redeems his people. But also who is a holy God and a God of justice who will judge sin and sinners. Right? And this is going to be a major thing in, in the law of Moses. Now, verse 3, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and they say, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, you see that line of demarcation. Yahweh is the Lord of heaven and earth, but he is not the covenant God of the Egyptians. He is not the personal God of the Egyptians. He's the God of the Hebrews, the God of the descendants of Abraham. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? We have stepped up our game in terms of prophetic revelation. Do you see that? Now, this is Yahweh speaking through Moses and Aaron, right? So this is not, this is not Moses being bold here. This is Yahweh who is coming in now and without any facade at all, right? He is unmasking his sovereignty and asserting his authority over this king of the Egyptians who claims to be divine. And he is saying, how long until you humble yourself before me? Several months before, Pharaoh says, I don't know who Yahweh is. I've never heard of that God. Why should I fear him? Now that God that he didn't even know, right, is saying, it, you better bow. You better humble yourself. Because you're either going to bow or you're going to be crushed. But either way, you'll end up on your face. Right? That's what he's saying. How long until you humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country. And skipping down to verse 6, he says, This will be a locust plague that neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have ever seen. Now, that's an important piece because locust plagues are actually not uncommon in the ancient Near East and even in the modern Middle East, right? And so locust plague, this is something that he knew about. I mean, this is not something that is outside the realm of his imagination, okay? But what God emphasizes is, you've never seen anything like what you're going to see this time. 
In other words, we talked about the, uh, one of the characteristics of the plagues being the intensification of the plagues as they progress, right? That they start out as nuisance plagues and then they become destructive plagues and then they become killing plagues, right? And, and the land's just being devastated. And one of the things that, that critical scholars, you know, unbelieving scholars who dismiss the miraculous nature of the plagues, they'll say, well, these were just natural phenomenon that were then interpreted as plagues from God. Uh, there's plenty of indicators in the text that, that, that just doesn't cut it. That doesn't, that doesn't explain the data that we have historically, right? He says, this is not going to be like your other locust plagues. This is going to be unlike any locust plague that you've ever had. And then do you notice, there's two things I want you to just notice quickly in that paragraph. One is that God says, let my people go that they may serve me. And clearly, in the subsequent conversation, Moses and Pharaoh are still talking about going three days into the wilderness to hold a feast to, Yah to Yahweh. But do you notice that's not actually mentioned in that first paragraph in chapter 10? That we, God's just kind of moved past that, right? Now it's just, let my people go that they may serve me. What, you mean three days in the wilderness? Sure, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> At this point, it's just, let them go. Now, he's not explicitly saying, let them go forever, right? But, but in essence, that's the implication. That's kind of what we've moved to. That's the trajectory we're moving toward. Okay, I just want to plant that seed in your mind. The second thing is, I want you to notice that Moses drops that demand on Pharaoh and then walks. He doesn't wait for a conversation. He comes in and he says, thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, how long until you humble yourself before me? If you do not let my people go to serve me, then tomorrow your land is going to be devastated with a locust plague like you and your fathers have never even imagined. And then he walks out. <laughs> now, who's in control of this conversation? That is not how you address a dignitary from what, has, what is arguably the most powerful nation on earth at this point. Egypt was kind of in that role until the plagues came along, right? And, and yet Moses just puts it out there and then walks away. Verse 7. Look at the movement within Pharaoh's administration. We saw this in the plague of hail, in the seventh plague, right? Because what, what happened in that plague? You remember the Lord sends the, the, the uh, announcement of the plague? And he says, uh, get, get your animals inside, right? And some of the Egyptians, this was in chapter 9 and in verse 20. Whoever feared the word of Yahweh among the servants of Pharaoh, Hurried his slaves and his livestock into the houses. And we said, whoa, right? You've got Egyptians now that are beginning to respect the word of the Lord. They are beginning to respond to the word of Moses rather than the word of Pharaoh. Pharaoh saying, don't worry about it, not a big deal. And they're saying, we're not taking any chances, right? We've already had six plagues that have just really made a mess of our nation. We're not taking a chance this time. Well, notice how much further we've gone now in the 10th in the tenth chapter in the 8th plague. Verse 7, Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long shall this man be a snare to us? Now, if that was all that you had, you could almost argue that what they're saying is that Pharaoh ought to do something about Moses, right? Take him out, lock him up, whatever. Moses is the troublemaker, right? No. It's the God of Moses that they're afraid of. Notice what they say. Let the people go that they may serve Yahweh their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? I think the New King James says destroyed, right? That's an amazing statement. Because these are not Israelites. These are not prophets like Moses and Aaron. These are Egyptians. And you remember in the first three plagues, Pharaoh had his magicians there with him, right? Replicating the signs, replicating the staff, replicating the water to blood, replicating the frogs. But they couldn't replicate the third plague. They couldn't produce the gnats. And, that, and that's where we see the first shift. They say, this is the finger of God, right? It was, it was remarkable to them. And then in the seventh plague, you've got some of Pharaoh's servants saying, better get the slaves and the animals inside because what Moses says is what happens. Here in the eighth plague now, they are appealing to Pharaoh. They are appealing to Pharaoh. They are now asking him, let them go. Get them out of here. Egypt is ruined. At what point? Even Pharaoh's servants recognize his arrogance and his stubbornness. 
That's a remarkable thing. Now, let's just think for a second about what we were talking about at the beginning of class. If the Lord did not bear long with the wicked, this conversation would never happen. Do you see that? It would never happen. I, I, I don't want to go too far down this road tonight, but do you realize that if God did not bear long with the wicked, we would not understand depravity in the way that we do? Because the reason that that we are able to begin to get a grasp of depravity the way that it's pictured in the Bible is because we have people in history like Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot, right? We have serial killers that, that kill for years and years and years. We have child molesters who, who uh, abuse children for years and dozens of children. I mean, we have stories like this where you, where you and I look at the problem of evil and we say, how could a look good and loving, all-powerful God allow this to go on? Romans 9 is saying the good and loving God allows evil to go on because he has a larger purpose to accomplish in that. But if you and I did not have evil like that in the world that we live in, then when we read passages like Romans 3 in the Bible that say there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good. There is none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. We would say that's hyperbole. And it's not. That's reality. That's the world that you and I live in. That is humanity post-fall. That's every one of us apart from grace. And the reason, now that it, certainly there's still many people who will deny that, right? Uh, amazingly. But, uh, but the reason that you and I are able to understand depravity the way that the Bible presents it is because when we read passages like that, we can say, oh yeah, we live in an awful world. We live in an evil world. We live in a sinful world where people seem to have just lost their minds. They love to do evil. They hate to do good. They call evil good. They call good evil. They would rather lie than tell the truth. They would rather do violence than do, do anything kind. Uh, we live in a fallen world. And so we recognize depravity. If God judged sin in the way that he is justified in doing at the immediate appearance of it, we would not understand depravity. You recognize that now? Do you see that? And so here, Pharaoh's servants are recognizing something about their own leader that they never would have seen unless God had given us eight plagues. Right? They couldn't have seen this on the first plague. They couldn't have seen this after four plagues. But after, you know, after seven plagues and now the announcement of an eighth, they say, our ruler is an idiot. You know? <laughs> I mean, he is an arrogant, stubborn person who is going to allow this nation to be destroyed rather than acknowledge this is a God that we have to fear. And what's the big deal? In the Egyptian scheme, they're polytheistic anyway. What's the problem adding one more God, right? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm arguing from their standpoint, right? I'm not suggesting that Yahweh should just be set alongside of their gods. But do you see why they would not be able to understand Pharaoh's stubbornness? What's one more God, <laughs> right? This Yahweh has greater power than our magicians. This Yahweh has greater power than our Pharaoh. This Yahweh has greater power than any of the gods that he has come up against already. And almost every single one of the ten plagues attack at least one and sometimes more Egyptian deities. This is a God we need to put in, in, you know, in, in our temple, so to speak. He needs to be included in the pantheon of gods that we acknowledge. What is the big deal here? But they are seeing the depravity and the stupidity of Pharaoh in a way that they never otherwise would. Now, I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder, are any of the people appealing to Pharaoh here people who will go with Moses and the children of Israel when they leave? I don't know, but I know that in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul, a prisoner in the city of Rome, sends greetings to the church in Philippi from the saints who are in Caesar's household. So how did there get to be saints in Caesar's household? Well, right, it's episodes like this, right? God gets his truth there. And so, so often when people read these stories, they want to say, well, why would God allow evil in this world? And why wouldn't God just take evil men out? And why, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart as if God is doing something wrong here? God is saving people. And God is teaching people, his people and other people, things that we never otherwise could learn. Some lessons have to be learned that way. 
Some lessons have to be learned by walking through an experience with evil. And God cannot just tell us the information and us really grasp it. We all know that, right? Some things you have to learn the hard way. Well, verse 8, Moses and Aaron are called back, brought back into Pharaoh, and he said, Go, serve Yahweh your God, but which ones are to go? He, he, he's willing to kind of concede the point a little bit, but he's got to make sure that everybody understands that it's still only by his permission. He's still in charge, right? At this point, he looks like a ridiculous, a ridiculous uh, figure, right? I mean, uh, uh, what, what basis does he, does he assert any control of the situation at all? His own administrators are saying the nation is ruined. And yet he wants to make sure that his authority is still on display. And so he says, yeah, you can go serve Yahweh your God. But, but okay, who are you taking with you? Let me make sure that I approve of this. And Moses says, oh, we're going to take everybody. We're going to take our men and our women. We're going to take our, our children. We're, we're going to take everybody. We're all going. And Pharaoh says, verse 10, the Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. Now, in case you didn't notice, that's not a, that's not a Lord bless you kind of statement, right? That's God help you if you think you're going to actually do that. He's not wishing them well. He's saying that your God would have to save you from me if you even attempt to do that. Look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve Yahweh for that's what you're asking. And then they are driven out of Pharaoh's presence. You see his assertion of his authority, right? I'm going to decide who gets to go. I'm going to decide the terms by which they are allowed to go. And when I'm done, I'll send you out. Last time, Moses just walked out, right? This is a competition between Yahweh and Pharaoh. And Yahweh is going to win. <laughs> Pharaoh is going to lose. And he has lost this already, right? Well, we pick up in verse 12. Then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and Yahweh brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been seen before, nor ever will be again. They covered the, whole, the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened. And they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained. Neither tree nor plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said... I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once. And plead with Yahweh your God only to remove this death from me. So he, Moses, went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with Yahweh. And Yahweh turned the wind into a very strong west wind, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. This is, this is a remarkable story. So um, I was even this afternoon reading some, uh, uh, some accounts of locust plagues from this part of the world in, in the last 200 years. Really remarkable the kind of devastation that locusts can do. You know, I mean, that's, that's not something that... I've never seen a swarm like this. I've seen locusts, but I've never seen a swarm of locusts like this. Uh, Devastating. Absolutely devastating. You notice that God brings this east wind all night, all day and all night, and by the morning, here come the locusts. I, I, I don't want to read too much in, into the story, but can you imagine how ominous that would seem? That Moses stretches out his staff and the wind starts to blow, and it blows all the rest of that day and all that night. What do you think Pharaoh is thinking? What do you think his administrators who pleaded with him not to go here are thinking? And then sure enough, you see that sun start to come up and you see that cloud. And it's a cloud of bugs coming. And they settle on the land. You can't even walk without crunching on locusts. They're everywhere. 
They eat everything. The trees are bare, right? The stalks of grain are stripped. Everything is gone. Why would Pharaoh refer to this as death? Did you notice that when he calls Moses in? Oh, plead with, plead with God just this once to remove this death from me. You know why he would say that? It's because this is an agrarian society. There are no McDonald's around the corner. Right? Nobody's got a freezer in their house with last year's deer meat still in it. Right? If you don't have grain, you are going to die. Because you don't have enough livestock to keep yourself alive. Right? This will kill you. You will die in an agrarian society if you have a famine or a locust plague or something of that nature. Right? Pharaoh realizes Egypt may have been ruined before this, but Egypt is going to die if this continues. And so he calls Moses back in hastily, verse 16 says, and says, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now, this is interesting. This is the second time he's acknowledged sin, right? He acknowledged it in the last plague. But you notice now, it's not just against Yahweh, but it's against Moses. I, I wonder, I don't know, I wouldn't be dogmatic about this, but I wonder if it's because of him basically throwing Moses out in the last interview, right? So Moses comes in, announces the plague, walks out. Pharaoh is offended, right? He's insulted by that, calls Moses back in and throws him out. And now Yahweh gets the last word. And Pharaoh says, I've sinned against Yahweh, and sorry about that as well. You know, I've sinned against you. But notice what he says in verse 17. Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once. <coughs> Now, he did not, in the last plague, when he acknowledged his sin, ask for forgiveness. That's something new. So what you see in the narrative is you see the, the plagues are progressively intensifying. The interaction between Moses and Pharaoh is progressively intensifying, right? But also, Pharaoh's attitude and the attitude of his people is, is changing. And so he acknowledges sin in the seventh plague. He asks for forgiveness for sin. In the eighth plague. And that's a difference. Do you think that it's genuine? Do you think that he's truly repentant? No, and I think you can actually see it even in the way that he says it. Do you notice this? Because there's still this arrogant desire to maintain what dignity he can. And, and folks, we talked a little bit about this last week. I want to just mention this point very quickly here. This is not what repentance looks like. Repentance, it, there is no dignity. There is no self-esteem that is maintained. There is no assertion of authority. There is no, well, I've sinned, and I'm sorry about that. But, you know, there is no but. There is no but. I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son. That's it. That's the end of the confession. That's the end of the conversation. But that's not the case with Pharaoh. He says, now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once. Only this once. I mean, Moses has got to be sitting there going, let's see. Water to blood, frogs, lice, flies, sickness of cattle, boils, hail. Look, we're on the eighth plague. We're on the eighth plague. This once for all of the previous times, right? That you've changed your mind, that you've hardened your heart, that you've acted like the unregenerate evil person that you are, right? What does he mean? Just this once, right? He's still trying to maintain some dignity. He doesn't want to lose face before his administration. Well, it's too late for that. He's already lost it. And let me just mention that here. This is the point that, you know, I need to learn. You may need to learn. All of us, I think, struggle to learn this. When repentance is called for, there is no self-esteem. There is no protecting your dignity. There is no asserting your authority or your righteousness in any other area. It's already gone. It's already too late for that. Okay? You just own it. You just own your sin. You just say, I'm wrong. I did wrong. That's it. Forgive me. There's no, there's no caveats on that. And so he says, please only this once, plead with Yahweh your God only to remove this death from me. Well, that's not the first time that Pharaoh has asked for, for Moses to intercede with Yahweh to remove the plague. So that only once has to refer to the forgiveness, not to the relief from the plague. But Moses goes out from Pharaoh, pleads with the Lord, and the Lord does indeed turn the wind around 
blows it away, right? Blows the locusts away out into the Red Sea so that not one is left. And Pharaoh's heart is hardened by Yahweh. By Yahweh. Now again, we spend a lot of time talking about the fact that this doesn't have to be God reaching down into the you know, inner chambers of Pharaoh's heart and mind and flipping switches, right? How is he hardening his heart? By the presentation of his word with authority, by the manner in which judgment is being brought, by the manner in which judgment is being drawn out, right? By the withholding of grace and the restraining grace that keeps depravity from reaching peak levels, right? We see that in Romans 1 and in other places. But regardless of how he does it, God is the one who does it. And God has the right to do that because Pharaoh is an evil person. He is not repentant. He is not humble. And God would be justified in destroying him at the beginning of his life. He is only keeping him alive and keeping him in power so that the greater glory of God can be made known. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's look at this ninth plague real quick. This is maybe the most bizarre plague to me, right? And also the most terrifying. The death of the firstborn is tragic and painful. This is the most terrifying for me. Okay, verse 21. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place. For three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. Then Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go, serve Yahweh. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. This does not learn. Right? But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings so that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we must take of them to serve Yahweh our God. And we do not know with what we must serve Yahweh until we arrive there. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, to Moses, Get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, As you say. I will not see your face again. Now, there's a chronology question here that we'll deal with in more detail next week because we're almost out of time. But uh, either Pharaoh goes back on that and calls Moses back in at the death of the firstborn, or possibly uh, there's a dyschronology happening here, which is very common in the Old Testament, by the way. It's actually, it actually happens in the New Testament as well, in the Gospels, where the story will be told uh, thematically, right? So the events of the ninth plague here, and then the tenth plague later, but some overlap happens. And so some of the conversation in chapter 11, I think, actually happens at this conversation, okay? I do think there's probably a later conversation, though, and I'll deal with that next week. Um, so all kinds of efforts to explain away the miraculous nature of this plague. You know, well, uh, maybe there was an eclipse of the sun. Really? Three-day eclipse of the sun that doesn't affect the land of Goshen. I mean, you know, honestly, this, this is the thing, okay? And, and I, under, I, I think I understand pretty well, probably, the uh, liberal critiques of, you know, the history that's written here. But honestly... It, it would be better, I think, just simply to say it's made up. You know? I'm not advocating that, by the way. Right? But if you are going to take a position of unbelief, just take a position of unbelief. And sadly, there are a lot of Old Testament scholars that say that. In fact, a lot of former evangelicals now, whose books are still very popular with some evangelicals, just say that. Exodus never happened. The invasion of Canaan never happened. The destruction of the Canaanites never happened. Period of the Judges, most of it never happened. Probably a historical king named David at some point, but nothing like what you read about in the Bible. And there are some leading scholars who are popular with evangelicals 
who are saying those kind of things. And as offensive as I find that, I find it far more believable than the earlier attempts by liberal critics to say, well, there was darkness, but you know, it was probably just some kind of natural phenomenon that, that somehow got mythologized. And I'm like, seriously? Either the story is true or it's not. And, and, and that's, that's what it comes down to. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again the third day, then everything in the Bible is not only believable, but you have to believe it. It's necessary to believe it, right? Because what is the greater miracle in Scripture than the resurrection of Jesus on the third day and then his ascension to the right hand of the Father? If you believe that, then you accept all of the rest of it. If you don't believe in the resurrection, why would you accept any of it? Wouldn't it be a lot easier to say this story about a three-day darkness is just made up than to try and find some way of explaining it? You know, a sandstorm. That's another one of the common explanations. A sandstorm. Okay, well, sandstorms do happen in that part of the world, and sandstorms can make it pretty dark, right? You know, you don't move around a whole lot. But a darkness that can be felt that affects Egypt, but not Goshen? None of them are satisfactory, right? So either it's true or it's not. How about we go with that? I'm telling you, I think it's true. And I feel like I'm on pretty firm ground there because Jesus accepted it as true, right? He refers to the Pentateuch regularly and attributes it to Moses. So if Jesus thinks that Moses wrote real history, I'll go with that, right? <laughs> A three-day dark. Now, this would be terrifying. And I don't know because the Bible doesn't describe the mechanics of this. How God did it, right? I don't know, right? And, and what it would look like, I don't know. I know that when I was a teenager, my family lived for a little while in a house that uh, the, the basement was completely underground. I, I guess basements are, but I mean, we had living space completely underground, right? My room was completely underground. No windows. And even the, the, the rooms outside of my room were underground. And so no ambient light making its way around the door frame. And when you would go in that bedroom and you would shut the door... You would have a darkness that I can't even describe. Now, some of you have been in places like that, right? But I remember as a teenager literally putting my hand in front of my face to see if I could see it. And there was no light. Unreal. It was, it was bizarre. Fantastic for sleeping, let me tell you. I mean, you just go down there for bed at night and you just like die. You know, you would never wake up if you were tired. Um, there's, no, there's no light to wake you up, you know? Uh, it's just remarkable. Something like that, but I suspect something more than that. Because you could feel it. Uh, you know, when you're in a really, really dark place, if you've ever gone like on a cave tour and they turn out the lights, you've had that experience. We've done that at Ruby Falls and different places back in the southeast. And, uh, you know, you hear the blood in your ears, right? And, and it's, it's oppressive, you know? It's frightening. Three days, and they can't move around. Now, what if one of them lights a lamp? This is the remarkable thing. By the way, I don't think the Charlton Heston movie gets this right. Um, there, there would be no light. There would be no light. You're basically stuck. You basically are staying right where you, Maybe you try and feel your way around. How terrifying would this be? Do you realize because this is the ninth plague, the third one in every cycle is unannounced. It just hits them out of nowhere. Moses doesn't go into Pharaoh and give him any warning. God just says, stretch out your hand. I'm going to turn out the lights. And yet in Goshen, there's light. What an awesome God we serve. Now, think for just a second, because we're out of time. Think about the metaphorical significance of some of these historical miracles, right? The metaphorical significance of historical miracles. What, what are we learning when Jesus turns the lights on for a man who's been blind? Well, we, we learn it in John chapter 9. Here's the man who's been born blind, and Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. What do we learn when Jesus feeds the people with bread in the wilderness? Well, we learn it in John chapter 6. He says, I am the bread of life. What do we learn when Jesus calls a dead man out of the tomb after four days? Well, we learn it in John chapter 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Now, that same principle, I believe, applies to all miracles in the Bible, right? More obviously to some than to others, obviously. But, uh, but, but the same basic principle. In other words, God is not an entertainer. And God is not doing things without purpose. And what do you see him doing here? He's bringing judgment against the gods of Egypt. Guess who the Egyptians worship above all? The God of the sun. In fact, there's more than one God in the Egyptian religion and mythology that is associated with the sun. And what is their condition spiritually? They are in darkness. And so what does God do to signify his ultimate sovereignty over them and their gods? He turns out the lights for three days. And when the lights come back on, Pharaoh says, get Moses in here. And he comes and he says, okay, you can go with all of you, but I'm going to keep your animals. And Moses says, I don't think so. I don't think so. He just doesn't learn. And finally, Pharaoh says, get away from me and never, never come and see my face again. Because if you do, you will die. And Moses says, as you say, I will not see your face again. This is the frightening thing. C.S. Lewis said it well, I think. There are only two types of people in the world. There are those to whom, to, to, who say to God, thy will be done, and to whom God will say, thy will be done. Right? Either you will say to God, thy will be done, or he will say to you, thy will be done. Moses is the Christ character in this story. Moses is the forerunner of Christ. He's the lawgiver. He's the savior. He's the redeemer. He's the miracle worker. He is the man sent from God, right? Coming out of the wilderness into a land of bondage to free people who are enslaved under sin. He's the Christ character. What does Pharaoh and every other unregenerate person apart from the grace of God do? They say, get away from me. I don't want to see you. And what will Christ say? Depart from me. I never knew you. He will say, have it your way. You, you've made that choice to run away from God. And so have I. Praise God, he made a choice to save us anyway. You and I are Israelites. You and I are the people in bondage to whom a Savior is sent, who after he arrives say, you've made things worse. Why are you messing things up? Get out of my life. And God says, hmm, I'm going to take you out anyway. Get to the Red Sea. What are you doing? You've brought us out here to kill us. Why did you get involved at all? The Lord says, hmm, I'm going to save you anyway. Go down to the law, to the, to the mountain. Receive the law. The people build a calf, start dancing and fornicating around it. God says, hmm, I'm going to save you anyway. I mean, that's the story for the next 40 years, right? We are not saved because we were more honest or more humble or more faithful than Pharaoh. Because the Israelites are not. And I hope you see that. And if you don't see that yet, I, I will labor to help you see it once we get past the Exodus. Okay. All right. Thank you. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Very good. All right. Let's bow and let's pray before we finish. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and for this uh, privilege that we've had to read Scripture together, to reflect upon the great lessons that it teaches us about you and about your will and about your ways in this world. Father, we wrestle greatly to understand why you allow evil to exist. When you could judge it immediately, when you could... Uh, cast it from your presence and out of your creation forever. And we know that one day you will do so. We long for that day. But we pray, Heavenly Father, that tonight the passage that we've looked at would help us be mindful that you have a purpose overriding all things. And that all that you do and all that you allow to be done in this world, you do for a purpose. And that not even evil is outside of your ultimate control. That it cannot outrun your ultimate purpose for your people. We pray, Heavenly Father, that that would help us to trust you more. Help us to be more in awe of you and more grateful for you and for the power that you have. Bless us and help us 
Lord, I pray that over the next few days as we have our sale on campus and people from our community come to this campus, that you would prepare hearts, that we would be able to share Christ and, and speak words of truth and to speak the gospel to those that we may meet. I pray, Father, that those in our community whose hearts you have been preparing to know Christ, that you would bring them onto our campus for this purpose and that you would help us and bless us that we might be able to minister to them in the context of these meetings over the next several days. Please use us for your glory. Use us for your will. Save us in the end, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.